Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our EVA uh, status briefing here at the Johnson Space Center. I'm Dan Hewitt. Uh, obviously, it's already been a very busy time for uh, the crew on board the station and here on the ground uh, in 2015. And it's not about to slow down. It's about to get a lot busier with uh, three upcoming spacewalks. Here to learn a little bit more about what's ahead, again, for the crews and all of our teams down here on the ground, I'm joined by Kenny Todd, the International Space Station Operations Integration Manager, uh, Tomas Gonzalez Torres, the Expedition 42 Lead Flight Director, then we have our trio of our lead spacewalk officers, starting with Karina Eversley, who will be uh, the lead spacewalk officer for EVA 29, Sarah Corona, the officer for EVA 30, and Arthur Thomason, the uh, officer for EVA 31. As usual, we'll hear from each of them, and then it'll open up for everybody's questions. So Kenny, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Thanks, Dan. Uh, well, as Dan said, it's been a, a very busy start to the, to the year. Um, we had uh, uh, SpaceX 5 launch earlier in the year. Uh, just, uh, just since the beginning of February alone, we've, uh, we've unberthed uh, the Dragon. Uh, it uh, arrived home safely. All of the uh, cargo has been returned, o turned over to the, to the owners. The, the, the science has been delivered to all the different scientists. So uh, all very good news on that front. Uh, this past Saturday morning, uh, for the final time, uh, we docked, undocked the, uh, the ESA-built uh, autonomous uh, transfer vehicle, which, uh, again, that was the last, uh, last vehicle that was in that fleet. And so uh, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate our ESA colleagues. Uh, that was an outstanding program uh, that they led. Uh, that particular vehicle uh, serviced this program extremely well for a lot of years, and so our hats are, are off to them. Uh, fresh on the heels of that undock, our, our Russian colleagues on, uh, on Tuesday uh, morning, very early, uh, Houston time launched 58 Progress, and, uh, and that uh, particular vehicle docked uh, to the aft end of station uh, yesterday around noontime here in, in Houston. Uh, flawless, no issues, and, uh, and so good. again, we're, we're glad to have that, uh, that vehicle uh, aboard as well. When we look forward, um, particularly on the EVA front, uh, if you look out through the rest of the year, we've got about seven EVAs on the schedule, uh, three of which you're going to hear about today. Um, the, uh, the real goal as we, we start to turn the corner uh, on the EVA front is to, uh, is to try to get us ready to, uh, to uh, prepare for the arrival of some of our commercial crew vehicles. Uh, you hear a lot about uh, what's going on with the development of those, those vehicles at the different uh, uh, vendor facilities, but, uh, but uh, on the station we also have to do a lot of work to be, to be ready to receive those vehicles. And so, uh, so you'll be hearing about, at least on the EVA side of things, uh, where we're going uh, here uh, with these next three EVAs. Looking forward past these EVAs, uh, we'll start uh, preparing for the return of, of Butch, uh, Elena, and Alexander. Uh, that's going to happen around the middle of March time frame. And then a couple of weeks later, we're going to welcome uh, Soyuz 42S, which will, uh, with, uh, along with it, uh, bring us our first uh, one-year expedition uh, crew and Scott Kelly and uh, Mikhail uh, Kornienko. So we're very excited to have those guys on board. I think we'll learn a lot. Uh, I think the research team is going to learn a lot, and, and uh, the lessons from that will, will uh, pay big dividends as we go forth as a as, a, as a, a program and as a nation and, and try to uh, explore beyond low Earth orbit. So, so we're looking forward to getting those guys on board. Uh, shortly after they arrive, we'll, uh, we'll be looking to, uh, to bring uh, the SpaceX 6 uh, Dragon on board uh, around the middle to end of April. Uh, still working through the details of the schedule, but, but that'll be roughly the time frame that we're talking about. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll have a very involved heavy science mission uh, with SpaceX. So, uh, with, that, uh, with that said, uh, it's going to be a very busy uh, springtime. When we start to turn our eyes towards the summer and the fall, uh, we're really going to put a lot of attention and focus on, on, uh, on expanding and uh, in, in some ways reassembling part of space station to allow ourselves to, uh, to uh, establish some berthing ports for all the different uh, commercial vehicles that will be coming to station. Um, the, uh, in, in general, uh, what we're trying to do is, is establish two berthing ports uh, for each of, of, the, uh, of the types of cargo of vehicles that we're having. We'll have uh, cargo vehicles, we'll have crew vehicles, 
uh, and we want to make sure that we have um, primary and backup ports for, for each one of those. And so um, uh, as we start to transform station a little bit, you're, in the middle of the year, you're going to see us uh, do some robotics work. We're going to take the, the permanent multipurpose module that's on the, uh, the Nader uh, side of, of Node 1, and we're going to move it up to the, to the Node 3 forward area. Uh, and what that's going to do is that's going to open up the Node 1 neighbor, Nader as a, uh, a cargo vehicle uh, berthing port. Uh, and, uh, and we have to do that because uh, the Node 2 Zenith uh, port, which is currently our backup port for, for berthing cargo vehicles, we're going to transform that and, and make that one of our, our ports that we're going to put uh, the crewed vehicles on when we start receiving those uh, here in the next couple of years. And so um, a lot of what's going to be going on through the EVAs uh, as well as on the internal side is, is starting to outfit um, the, uh, the front end of PMA2. We're going to move PMA3, move it over to that node to Zenith location, and that's where, uh, that's where we're going to be prepared to receive uh, crew vehicles is on node 2 forward and node 2 Zenith. So again, I say all that to say we're doing a lot of, doing a lot of um, uh, reconfiguration this year. So in addition to some, some long duration science and some uh, you know, uh, cargo ops and all the other things, we really are trying to, to take station into this next phase in support uh, of, the, uh, of the commercial uh, industries and, and, uh, and providers. But uh, as I said earlier, it all kind of gets started here in the next couple of weeks uh, with this series of EVAs. Uh, so far, uh, the preparations are going, uh, I think, reasonably well uh, for the EVAs. I, I did want to mention to you that we have what I consider to be one piece of, of non-standard open work. Uh, in general, when you're several days out from an EVA, you're, you're still trying to tidy things up and get the products done and, and get ready to go, and go out to hatch. Um, so we tend to divide things in terms of standard and non-standard. Uh, and, and so we do have what I consider to be one non-standard piece of open work. Uh, a couple of months ago on orbit, uh, during one of our suit maintenance activities, uh, we, we had uh, one of the suits and we were trying to do a, a loop scrub activity with it. The, uh, the uh, um, suit didn't, the fan pump step inside that suit did not spin up. And uh, as most of you know, that's, that's the same area of concern that we had back in uh, 2013 uh, when we, uh, we had the issue with the, uh, with the water in the helmet. So um, obviously it gets a lot of attention and people want to try to understand what's going on. Uh, so so we, uh, we did some troubleshooting. Um, at the time, our, our best guess was that there was mechanical binding in that fan pump set. The, pump, the, the fan itself wouldn't turn. Uh, we put a new uh, fan pump set in uh, that we had on orbit and, and, uh, and it's been working um, with, with no issues since that point. Um, subsequent to that, a particular failure um, in January, uh, we had a second suit. Uh, we were doing the same type of activity and encountered the same type of failure in the fan pump sub area. And uh, uh, that, that got us thinking, uh, it, you know, what's changed, what, what, what's happening. It appeared to be the same type of, of mechanical binding issue. And uh, we did some more, more testing on orbit. Uh, we couldn't directly get into the fan pump sub. It's all a, a, a single unit. Um, and so we didn't get into it, but we, we kind of got enough data in and around it uh, through our testing on orbit to say that we still felt like it was mechanical binding. We took the opportunity, um, in fact, very late in the SpaceX flow to, uh, to pull that particular fan pump set along with the one that we, that we pulled out in, in December and return those, uh, those two fan pump sets on, on SpaceX 5. Uh, since that time, uh, the team uh, responsible for uh, the engineering on our suits and our engineering teams here have been working uh, exhaustively to, uh, to try to uh, understand exactly what was going on. Um, the, uh, the, the thought um, going into the, uh, to the initial evaluation of the, of the, the pump sub issue uh, was that perhaps we might be getting water in some other places of the fan pump set, and 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 as they uh, began to to look at um, particular parts of the fan pump set, in particular the bearings, um, it, it all started to make sense. We're seeing binding, and at the same time, we're seeing when they got inside them, they're seeing some corrosion there. So so all the evidence is lining up to say that uh, that we're getting water in and around uh, some of the some of the bearings inside the fan pump set, 
uh, if you look at the unit itself, it's, uh, the, the, the fan and, and the pump sator, separator are attached to a, to a drive shaft that run back to the motor and there's two sets of bearings and, and the bearings that are closest to the fan are the ones that we're seeing this corrosion on. And when you look at some of the things that we've done uh, since uh, 2013 when we had the water and helmet issue, uh, we, we've implemented a lot of different um, uh, tests that we're doing, samples, uh, if you will, that allow us to get some insight into how the water chemistry is within the, uh, within the suit. Um, and we do that as part of our normal maintenance activities. And what we're discovering is that it looks like that with the number of times we're, we're powering on this fan pump set, uh, in doing so, we're actually putting a little bit more water in each time we're doing that. And, and over a period of time, we're, we're putting enough water in there that, that once you, you, you disengage the suit and power it down, that that water sits in that area in the fan pump step and it eventually migrates into, into these bearings. And so um, at this point, that's, uh, that's, we're, we're pretty certain that's what's going on. That's the method by which we're getting the extra water in the suit. We never had this issue before but we're putting more, more water in this particular area of the fan pump set now as a result of, of uh, doing the extra sampling. And so, so we're off to, uh, to take a fresh look at, at how, we, how we ensure the water chemistry uh, stays, stays good. Uh, we think we've, we've, uh, we've come a long way in our understanding of that and feel very confident that, uh, that uh, the water quality itself is no longer an issue. And now we just need to go back and, and, uh, and relook at our sampling techniques and make sure that we're, we're sound there in our thinking and that we're, uh, we're not doing anything to, to further damage uh, the pump steps that we, uh, that we have on orbit. So where does that leave us now going into these EVAs? Um, the two suits that, that we have on orbit that we're going out EVA with uh, at this point uh, have operated every time we turn, we've, we've, we've turned them on. Um, they're, um, we're looking at the data uh, constantly every time we turn them on and put them through their paces. Uh, there's, um, at least on one of the suits, some evidence, if you will, that there may be some corrosion in that bearing area. And so the team um, at uh, United Technologies and, and our engineering guys here are working very hard to, to understand um, uh, you know, what, the, what the, the level of corrosion might be and whether or not it has any impact on our ability to uh, to uh, keep the fan operating during the, during the EVA itself. Uh, all indicators are based on all the data from the ground testing as well as the testing of the suits on orbit is that, that we'll work our way through this and these, these suits are gonna be okay. But that said is we have a, 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 some open work left to do. That's the non-standard part of this that we have to get, uh, get worked out over the next uh, few days here. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're going to be data driven. We'll do these EVAs when the timing's right, when we're sure that we got suits that uh, we have high confidence we can go out, go out the hatch with and, and do the, uh, the task uh, that, are, that are before us. Uh, these tasks are, are not going to be easy, the ones that we're talking about here. And so uh, we want to ensure that, uh, that we put ourselves uh, in a position for success when we, when we do go out the hatch. So anyway, I'm very, very confident um, that we'll, uh, we'll get there with that. One thing I do want to want to make sure that I touch on with you guys, because again, we talked about the fan pump stuff and we talked about the, the water and helmet issue. Um, when uh, with the water and the helmet, that was a, a, a totally different root cause issue. That was a, an issue with with uh, portholes getting clogged up in the in the water separator. That was due to the water chemistry issue that we talked about earlier. Um, and through that, uh, through that clogging, uh, water was allowed to get into the, to the vent flow that, that goes up uh, into, uh, into the helmet. That is not an issue here. What we're talking about is a, is a failure of the pump to start up. Uh, that in and of itself is not a, a, a water type of event where you could get water in a helmet. Uh, in fact, our, our ops uh, team here will tell you this is something that they train for. They understand that, that you know, they have cue cards, uh, checklists, cuff lists, for, for when a fan pump fails off. So this is, you know, a fan pump could fail for a, a variety of reasons. We've just found one here uh, based on, uh, on this corrosion that's getting in the system. So uh, again, we'll go work our way through that and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be data driven. We'll, we'll do the EVA when, when it's ready. At this point, I'm gonna do an IMMT tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll see where the different teams are, where we're at on our data. We're continuing to meet this afternoon. We'll, we'll uh, with, uh, at a technical level, and then we'll, we'll circle back up as a program in the morning and, and, 
figure out uh, when the right time to go to these EBAs are, but uh, but I'm optimistic we will uh, we'll be going out to hatch very soon here. And with that, I'll uh, I'll pass it over to Tomas. Okay. All right, thanks a lot, Kenny. Um, so I am uh, Tomas Gonzalez Torres, Increment uh, Lead Flight Director for Increment uh, 42. Um, I'm going to give a really high big picture, and then I'll let the experts here talk in, uh, in details about the specific EVAs. These EVAs are going to be uh, numbers 29, 30, and 31. Um, all of them expected to have egress start time right around 6.15 uh, uh, Central Daylight Time, and uh, each expected to last right around uh, six and a half hours. Uh, all three of them will be in U.S. spacesuits and uh, will be egressed from uh, the U.S. Quest airlock. Uh, the uh, EV crew members, the crew members that will be performing the easy EVAs are uh, Barry Wilmore. Uh, we call him Butch. And he's going to be EV1 for uh, EVAs uh, 29 and 30. And then uh, Terry Verts, and uh, he will be uh, <clears throat> EV1 on uh, the third EVA in the series, uh, EVA uh, 31, or spacewalk number 31. Uh, this will be uh, Butch's second, third, and fourth EVAs, and uh, Terry's first, second, and third EVAs. Uh, on uh, the inside of the space station, uh, Samantha Christopher Eddy, um, the other USOS crew member, will be helping to uh, suit up the crew before they go outside, and uh, she will also be helping on the second EVA in the series, uh, number 30, with uh, the robotics uh, operations. The lead flight directors for these EVAs um, are going to be uh, Tony Sakachi uh, for the, uh, the first and third EVA, uh, spacewalks in the series, and then uh, Greg Whitney will be the lead flight director, excuse me, for, uh, uh, for the second EVA in the series. <clears throat> um, as uh, Kenny mentioned, um, overall, um, over the next several months, the ISS is going to be going through some uh, reconfiguration. Um, a couple of the items that we're going to be doing are uh, specifically relocating the, the PMM module um, from the uh, node one nadir to the node three forward. So it's going from the blue spot in the picture to the green spot. Uh, and then the other relocation is gonna be of the uh, PMA three moving from uh, node three ports to node two zenith, again from blue spot uh, to the green spot. And, and all of this is um, to helping Again, provide uh, new berthing ports um, for, for future vehicles. Uh, in addition uh, to, the, uh, to the PMA relocations on the ends of those PMAs, um, in the near future, some IDAs or international docking adapters are going to be flown up, and those are going to be attached again uh, to the PMAs themselves. And these EVAs, um, their spacewalks coming up, are specifically uh, supporting uh, the uh, external reconfiguration of the ISS so that we can support um, these objectives and the, these new uh, berthing ports. Um, the, uh, the main objectives of the, uh, the upcoming three spacewalks um, are uh, pretty focused on, uh, on a couple of things. Uh, for EVA 29, it's uh, all going to be IDA cable routing, then EVA 30 will complete the cable routing along with uh, some uh, SSRMS. Um, the end effector lead lubrication, and then also on uh, EVA 31 is going to be the, uh, the C2V2 or the common communications for visiting vehicles uh, cable routing. Uh, and with that, uh, that's the high level. I'll go ahead and pass it on to uh, Karina Eversley to uh, begin with the, uh, the first EVA. Okay. Thanks, Tomas. I'm uh, Karina Eversley. I'll be the lead EVA officer for the first EVA in the series. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the rest of my team. I have Scott Ray. Sandy Fletcher, Brian Alpert, and Ernie Bell that will be working with me during the EVA. Now the goal of US EVA 29 is to uh, provide, lay the cables that will provide the power and data for the international docking adapter number one that's going to be installed on the forward end of PMA number two uh, later this year. This will be the most complicated uh, cable routing task that we have performed by EVA on ISS to date. And I should state that there is an equally complicated set of cable routing that has to be done internal to the space station as well. Um, this photo here shows the forward end cone of node two and the PMA two, and that's uh, the overview of the work site that we'll be working in for the entire EVA. Um, you can see two of the micrometeoroid orbital debris shields that are pointed out there. The crew will have to remove those two shields in order to make several connections. And this will be the first time that we've opened this type of end cone shield 
although we have opened a circumferential shield of this type in the past. Uh, the connections underneath these shields were never expected to be operated by EVA crew members. And so they were designed with a different type of a connector, uh, one that's commonly used inside the space station instead of our typical EVA connector. And I have a couple of examples to show you. So uh, this is the standard EVA connector that we use, and you operate it by pulling a lever back and then separating the two halves, realign the two halves, and push the lever forward. And it was designed uh, to be more easily operated by somebody in a spacesuit glove. The other connectors that we will have to use on this EVA um, require a 360 degree rotation of a collar. And then in order to mate them, you have to actually align the keying features, which can be a little tricky to do, and rotate the, the collar back. And that rotation is difficult to do uh, in the gloves, as well as all the alignment that's required of that type of connector. Um, the crew will be making five of that uh, type of connector connection under these shields, four under the port shield and one under the starboard shield. And although this will be the first time that the uh, ISS EVA crew has had to operate this type of connector, we have uh, used these connectors before on the Hubble Space Telescope servicing missions. And actually, if the crew does have difficulty with these connections, um, we have a Hubble-designed tool that's basically just a, a spring-loaded set of connector pliers that we can use to get some additional leverage on that collar. Okay, and I think I have another graphic that uh, shows the, the view of what the cabling will look like in its final configuration when the IDA is in place. One thing to point out here are the two uh, connector panels on the IDA. You can see one on the starboard zenith quadrant, which is on the right-hand side of the picture, and then there's a second one directly nadir that's just out of view here. Um, and we will be stowing the ends of our cables on the PMA near those two locations, so they'll be waiting there for when the IDA arrives. Now, for some fun facts on the cables that we'll be routing on this EVA, there are 10 cables total that branch into 21 different legs. Uh, this is the set of cables in one of the bags that you see. So there's a total of 364 feet of cable that the crew will be routing uh, between the first two EVAs. And the longest individual run of cable the crew will deploy on this EVA is 43 feet. It happens to be the, the second one that's colored purple in this view. Um, to help the crew keep track of all the different cables and the different legs, we actually added colored patches periodically along the cables. Um, and we do use those colors extensively in our procedures and the graphics that we use, as well as the movie that you'll see in just a moment. The cables will be transported to the worksite in specially designed bags. And each bag has three layers inside, and each layer has several straps to hold all the different legs of the cables. Uh, we packed the cable bags on the ground uh, with the cable legs going in uh, according to the order in which we need to deploy them. OK, and with that, I will start the movie. Okay, so on this first EVA, Butch Wilmore is going to be EV1, and he'll egress the airlock first, wearing the suit with the red stripes. And he'll bring out a large bundle consisting of the Ida cable bag and a crew lock bag, and then Terry will egress with the pure white suit and carrying an identical large bundle. Butch will translate up the Cetus spur and over to the port Zena side of the Destiny lab and then to the forward end cone of the Harmony node. And that, of course, is using the handrail path you see blinking there. Meanwhile, Terry will translate around the perimeter of external stowage platform number two and along the starboard side of Destiny and Harmony to the forward end cone. And once there, both crew members will stow their crew lock bags and the IDA cable bags uh, near the worksite. And they'll then spend some time installing wire tie restraints uh, on the PMA2 along the routes that the cables will follow throughout the rest of the EVA. And you can see in this uh, video from the training in the neutral buoyancy lab, they're wrapping wire ties around uh, handrails and different things that we can then use to restrain the cables. 
Uh, finally, Butch will move some of the existing PMA2 cabling to get it out of the way uh, for removal of the first shield. You can see that it's routed across the shield that we need to open. So Butch and Terry will work together to release the three bolts holding the port shield in place and move it out of the way. And Terry will open the port IDA cable bag. Butch will disconnect the four existing cables under the shield, which previously provided services for the space shuttle and still do provide the heater power for PMA2. One by one, Terry will hand him four new IDA cables to connect. And on this graphic here, you can see on the left side is the current configuration with cir red circles around the four that uh, Butch will disconnect. And on the right side, you can see the four new IDA cables connected with the light blue and the dark blue cables are actually routed underneath the handrails. Um, and the other two are routed past the handrails. And in that way, the cables actually fit into gaps on either side of the handrail so they can exit from underneath the shield. So once all four cables have been connected, the crew will reinstall the shield and then translate to the other side where they will swap roles. Butch will open the cable bag. They'll work together to open the shield. Terry will disconnect the existing cable. And Butch will hand him the new IDA cable to connect. And then they'll reinstall that shield. And before leaving the starboard cable bag, Butch will retrieve a cable from it and bring it to the port side of Harmony where he'll attach it to a handrail and begin uncoiling it. He'll first follow the uh, handrail path you see highlighted in yellow uh, to unroll, unroll the cable aft towards the Destiny Lab where he'll make two connections. And then he'll come back forward and stow a leg uh, that will ultimately go up PMA3 towards Ida number two later on. And finally, he'll take the remaining leg and uncoil it as he moves forward, securing the cable in the wire ties that were installed at the beginning of the EVA. And the remaining coil of cable will be stowed on PMA2 until Ida-1 arrives. And that's the longest of the, the cables on the EVA. Meanwhile, Terry will begin unpacking and routing cables from the port cable bag, starting with the two cables that restore power and telemetry for the PMA2 heaters. And he'll be making the two connections that you see there labeled as P1 and P2. Now, each of these two cables has a leg that continues forward uh, towards the forward end of PMA2. One of them goes zenith, and one goes nadir. And these are stowed near those locations I pointed out earlier where the connector panels will eventually be. So for the remainder of the EVA, Butch will deploy the cables that follow uh, the port nadir route and Terry will deploy cables that follow a zenith or starboard path. And you'll see that we just continue stowing the cables on the PMA near where those connector panels will be. And they, they tend to follow sort of highways. And so that's the route that we put the wire ties on at the beginning of the EVA. The final set of cables that Butch will stow are three legs that will ultimately go to item number two. And uh, once we have those stowed, that will empty out the port cable bag. And during that time, Terry finishes his last cable on the starboard side. And that cable has an Ida 1 leg and an Ida 2 leg that gets stowed on the node 2 forward end cone. At this point, there will be uh, two cables remaining in the starboard cable bag, which will be deployed on the second EVA, and Sarah will be providing the details on those in a few moments. Um, the crew will pack up their crew lock bags, and the port IDA cable bag will leave the starboard IDA cable bag there with those two cables in it. And the crew will follow their original translation path back to the airlock. Uh, if we are ahead on the timeline on this day, we will uh, go ahead and and uh, finish as much of the cable routing as time allows. And that, so that's our only get ahead for this EVA. So that uh, covers the first EVA in the series. And I'll hand it over to Sarah Corona to talk about the second.
Thank you, Karina. I am Sarah Corona. I'm the, the lead spacewalk officer for EVA 30. Um, also like to recognize the folks who will be in the back room for this EVA. Farouk Sabor and Ali Batcoletti will be on the task side, and Brian Elpert and Paul Dum will be on the system side. And as it's been mentioned, um, Butch Wilmore is going to be EV1 for this EVA, and Terry Burtz is going to be EV2 with um, Samantha Christopheretti. She is going to be the, the IV crew member. I'm getting into the details of the EVA. I think it's best to just go ahead and roll the video. So let's go ahead and start the, the video. So on uh, US EVA 30 with Butch Wilmore being EV1, he is going to be wearing the red stripes on the spacesuit. And Terry Burtz being EV2, he is going to be wearing the, uh, the white stripes on his suit. So both crew members are going to egress the airlock, which is going to be egressing first. And you see Terry, who's going to be translating to the lab forward end cone, um, very similar translation path to the first DVA. And he's at that end cone, he's going to be putting some inhibits in place um, that is required for mating and demating some cables that's for the IDA task. So he does some on the starboard side, and then he goes to the nadir side to um, essentially unplug this visiting vehicle power um, so that during the EVA, we are not making any hot mates or demates. Meanwhile, Butch is going to be translating to node 2 zenith forward end cone, again, a very similar translation path that he had for EVA1. And he's going to be going to PMA2, the pressurized mating adapter, same, same uh, worksite location as EVA1. He's going to be setting up that area, setting down a, a bag in which they are going to be removing the PMA2 cover. So this cover acts as a thermal and micrometeorite protection and we need to remove it because it's, this is where item one is going to be installed. So both crew members help in that removal and they pack up that cover and put it into the bag. Once that's complete, um, the crew is going to finish up the cable routing that was not completed on the, the first TBA. So Terry's gonna be working on the starboard side. You see him right here. He is mating and demating some connectors. Um, this is what those inhibits were needed so that none of these uh, connections that he has or will be will be hot mates or, or demates. So Butch is going to be on the port side and he's essentially going to be doing the same thing. Um, you'll be seeing him mating and demating some of those connectors here. And once the connectors have been um, connected up, they are going to continue the cable routing of that. Um, <clears throat> as Karina mentioned some of these are for IDA-1 and some of these are for IDA-2. Moving over to, back over to Terry with this orange cable, um, you'll see this orange cable going up to the node 2 forward end cone and that will be needed for IDA-2 connections. Moving back over to Terry, uh, the cables that are going to be um, at the PMA-2 nadir location, that's for IDA-1. And then you can see him routing the ones that are going to be needed for IDA-2, again on that node 2 forward end cone. And that should complete all of the IDA cable routing that's required for these EVAs. Once that's done, um, Terry's going to head back to the lab forward end cone and basically plug back in that vis visiting vehicle power. So those inhibits he put in place, he's going to go ahead and mate those back again. And both crew members are going to help with the, the cleanup at the work site of PMA2. Um, Terry is going to go ahead and pick up that bag that was left out on EVA-1 and bring that back inside in the airlock. And Butch is going to grab the bag that has the PMA-2 cover in it and bring that back to the airlock. And so they stow both of those bags inside the airlock and then they grab the bags that they will need for the rest of the tasks for the EVA. So Terry's task is going to be on ESP-2, which is the external stowage platform. He is going to be reconfiguring a foot restraint, and he will then go ahead and ingress into that foot restraint so he can complete the lubrication of the space station remote manipulator system, the SSRMS latching end effector, the LEE. And so Samantha Christopher Reddy, she's going to be the robotics operator for the EVA. So Butch and Samantha are going to be, I'm sorry, Terry and Samantha are going to be talking throughout the EVA, um, making sure that the arm is in a location where Terry can get to the lubrication that's required. 
And so we are going to be essentially lubricating five different portions of the Lee, the latching end effector. This picture shows the, the face of the Lee, and you can see that there are four latches on it, labeled latch one, two, three, and four. And the next picture shows these latches in the extended position. So while the latches are the extended, um, we will be able to lubricate the latch ball screws, equalization brackets, and latch deployment rollers. This next picture shows the latches in the retracted position where we can lubricate the linear track bearings. Another thing that we're going to be lubricating is the rigidized central ball screw. So in this video, you can see that this ball screw is right in the middle of the Lee, and they are going to be putting grease on a tool um, and getting the feel for what that ball screw feels like through the gloved hand in using this tool. And so it's, it's a, you can see it, and the reason we're doing that first is because we really want to get Terry to have that feel of um, how it feels to, to lubricate uh, because the next task is going to be lubricating a similar ball screw for the latches. And so in this video, you can see they're going to insert this tool into the cavity of the latch and it is all going to be a, a blind operation. He's not going to actually physically see the, the ball screw that he is lubricating, and that's why we want him to make sure he is comfortable so that he knows he is lubricating the, the portion that we would like. So this is showing what it will look like on the inside of that latch and spreading grease all along that ball screw. Again, Terry's not going to be able to see that, but this is what it will look like. Once that lubrication is complete, we're going to go ahead and retract the latches so we can lubricate the linear track bearings. So each latch has these two track bearings, and we're going to lubricate both sides of those tracks on each of the four latches. If there's enough time in the EVA, we're going to go ahead and continue lubrication. We're going to extend the latches again <clears throat> to lubricate the equalization brackets as well as the deployment rollers. So in this picture, again, of the extended latch, um, you can see the equalization brackets. So each latch has one equalization bracket, and then there are four latch deployment rollers per latch. So for the latch deployment rollers, we're just basically putting a little dab of grease onto the rollers. In the equalization bracket, we put a little grease along the, the inboard and the outboard sides of that bracket. Meanwhile, Butch is going to be doing the, the PMM prep portion of his EVA, so the permanent multipurpose module. Um, on his way to the work site, he's going to go up to the Z1 port toolbox where he's going to get a socket that's required um, for the work site out at node 3. So you can see his translation path out to node 3. First, he's going to go to the forward side of node 3 and he's going to be removing a non-propulsive valve, an NPV, that when we are relocating the PMM, it's a very tight clearance of, of that relocation. So we'd like to remove this valve during this EVA and then in its place install a vent cover plate. So that is the valve that we're going to remove and that vent cover plate is installed. We install that cover plate to protect the sealing surfaces of that valve because once the PMM is relocated here, we do have plans to reinstall that valve. Once that's complete, he moves to the starboard side and is going to be removing a handrail that has actual physical interference when the PMM is relocated here. So we will not be reinstalling it. Next in view is the, the CBM, the common berthing mechanism. And this is actually where the, um, the PMM is going to be relocated. And so there are some launch locks that need to be released, as well as a flap that needs to be opened for some camera views. So on the CBMs, there are four pedals, each that has two launch locks. And so Butch is going to be releasing all eight of those launch locks on this CBM. When he is complete with the forward side of node 3, he's going to translate over to the aft side. You can see his translation path here. So the aft side going to that CVM and essentially doing the same thing. Um, in this location, 
is where the BEAM experiment, the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, is going to be um, birthed to. And so again, he needs to release the launch locks of all four pedals and then open up the flap that's needed for the camera views. So once all of the launch locks are released, and this is for both the forward and the aft CBM, the ground is gonna command these pedals open to a 45 degree position, and which is going to verify that they did deploy in that, that position. And then the ground is gonna go ahead and close them, and which is gonna verify that they are closed. Once that's complete, he's gonna head back to that toolbox, put his socket away, and head on back to the airlock. And so Butch and Terry will be back at the airlock, and that's the, the planned tasks for this EVA. We do anticipate we'll have some time for the get-aheads. Uh, the first get-ahead, we would be putting wire ties on the S0 truss, and this is getting a head start for the third EVA. Another task we can do is to be removing a light that's on a camera port that's a the P1 lower outboard work site. So the light is dim there, so we'll bring the light inside and get that fixed. Another task would be reconfiguring the CETA cart. The CETA cart's the crew and equipment translation aid. So we basically want to put these in a lower profile for the, the MT, the mobile transporter, so it, it won't have any clearance issues with it. So we tie some brake handles back. <clears throat> We go ahead and we remove a coupler. There's the coupler shown there and also a swing arm. So we remove the coupler and the swing arm and we pull those off and translate over to along the, S, the, along the truss to S0 where we're gonna go ahead and stow that out of the way on the wedge face there. This is showing the port seat of cart where at this location all we would need to do is take a tether to tie down these brake handles. Another task we can do is back at the airlock. Uh, there is a, a known sharp edge along the handrail of the airlock and so we have a, a handrail clamp that can go over that sharp edge. You can see it here in the picture. So we install that and so since this is such a highly traveled area we install that clamp and then the crew doesn't need to worry about um, cutting their glove or, or anything else on their spacesuit when going over that handrail. And so that is the get-aheads that we can do for the CVA, and that, uh, that's it for the video. Um, I also have some tools to, sh to show you of uh, how we're gonna be doing some of the lubrication. So this was, the, the Lee was never intended to be lubricated in this manner, uh, so we developed um, what we call the BLT. This is the, the ball screw lubrication tool. It's made out of a probe and some wire ties and lots of tape on it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have a grease gun that we, that, that Terry's gonna be um, <coughs> inserting the grease on right into this uh, little cup holder here and then inserting this into the latches on the lee. We also have several of these EVA wipes that we'll have at the work site um, just to contain grease, you know, things can get greasy. And so we've got wipes that you can use to, to catch any of the grease that's needed. Okay. Um, and those are the details I have for uh, EVA 30. With that, I'll pass it on to Art Thomason to uh, talk the details of EVA 31. Great, thanks a lot, Sarah. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Art Thomason. I am the EVA officer for US EVA 31. Uh, during the development of this EVA, I've had the privilege of working with an outstanding team. I'd like to recognize Jordan Lindsay, David Simon, and Brian Alpert for all the great work they've done in getting us ready to perform this EVA in space. I'd also like to recognize the crew that'll be performing this EVA on orbit. Uh, we have Terry Vertz, uh, Butch Wilmore, and Samantha Cristoforetti. Uh, Terry will be coming out in the suit with the red stripes indicating he is the lead spacewalker or EV-1. Uh, Butch will be wearing the suit with the white stripes as EV-2. And then Samantha will be the IV or intravehicular crew member. She'll be helping both Terry and Butch get suited up for this spacewalk and out the door successfully. Now the purpose of this EVA is to install the Common Communications for Visiting Vehicle System, or C2V2 as we call it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, C2V2 will aid visiting vehicles and rendezvous and docking um, with the International Space Station. Now this system, the C2V2 system, consists of two booms, 
four antennas, and three reflectors. Uh, on the CVA, we'll also be routing 400 feet of cable. Uh, this cable consists of four 100-foot legs uh, that'll be routed from the center of the space station out to each antenna. Now, fortunately, Butch and Terry both had an opportunity to see this hardware during training in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, uh, so they're definitely familiar with the hardware. Uh, since they've seen it, we've, had, we've tweaked the, the plan a little bit to increase efficiency, uh, but we've uplinked procedures, briefing packages, and videos to make sure they have all the details they need to perform a successful spacewalk. Uh, with that, we can get into more of the details and the choreography of the spacewalk, so I'd like to roll the video. So starting out for US EVA 31, uh, Terry will come out first. He'll be the lead spacewalker, wearing the suit with the red stripes. Butch will pass out the large ORU bag with the four cable reels in it. He'll also pass out the larger of the two booms, the P3 boom. And Butch will come out with the shorter of the two booms that will be going on the starboard side. Here you see uh, both booms. The boom on the bottom is the port boom that Terry will bring out. It has a reflector bag and an antenna bag attached to it. The boom at the top of the page is the starboard boom that Butch will bring out, and it has an antenna bag on it. Here you see the antenna bag, uh, the hi-fi hardware. Uh, we configure the antennas in this way to protect the delicate surface on the end of the antennas. Here you see an antenna. In the upper right-hand corner, that white surface is the area that we're trying to protect. Uh, we also have a protective cover that will be installed on it. Now you see that cover at the top of the screen here. Now at this point, both crew members will head to their respective work sites. Uh, Butch will head, hard, will head starboard, and here you see Terry uh, headed port. Terry will translate over the rat's nest. Uh, we call it that because of all the cabling in the area. So he'll continue out to the P3 or port three truss. There he'll install his boom into a worksite interface or WIF. Uh, this WIF is typically used for foot restraints for crew members, but this um, hardware has been adapted to install into this mechanism. Once he gets the boom installed, Terry will remove both bags and stow those on structure. He'll then open up the antenna bag. You see that opening up here, flashing. He'll remove both antennas and install them on the boom. Uh, from there, he'll remove the protective cover from the antennas and stow those in the crew lock bag. Uh, here you see the antennas in their final configuration. We have both antennas installed. Uh, we also have retro reflectors installed. Uh, we're gonna wait till the end of the EVA to get these installed uh, because they're delicate and we wanna protect the, the glass on those reflectors. So meanwhile, while Terry is working on the port side, Butch will head out to the starboard side. He'll head out to S3 or the starboard three truss. He'll install the shorter of the two booms in S3 WIF 13. Once he gets that installed, he'll move his crew lock bag with antennas in it off to a handrail. And then he'll open up that bag and install both antennas into the boom. He'll use a pit pin or pull-in, pull-out pin to secure these to the boom. Once both are installed, he'll remove the protective covering from the antennas. At this point, he'll close up the bag and leave it at the work site because we'll use it to bring back in caps later in the EVA. So at this point, both crew members will be headed back towards the US airlock. Here you see Butch headed back to the large ORU bag. This contains the four cable reels that will be deployed during the EVA. He's gonna move this bag to the US laboratory uh, to get it in close proximity to the debris shield that the Z2V2 system connects under. So here you see Butch and Terry working together to remove the debris shield. They'll demate a connector under that shield and mate the C2V2 connector and then reintegrate a J7 connector that they demated into the C2V2 cable. Here you see the J7 connector that the crew will demate. This actually runs to GPS and KU band antennas. Here you see the C2V2 connector. The connector on the left is the one that will attach underneath the shield. The one on the right will reintegrate the GPS and KU band system. The crew will then work together to reinstall the shield. At this point, Butch will head over to the larger ORU bag and he'll retrieve two cable reels. 
he'll hand one to Terry and he'll keep one for himself. And they'll get ready to route the port legs. Here you see four of the cable bags. These bags are all tied together by one connector that you see at the bottom of the pitch here that connects underneath the shield. Here you see the 100 feet of cable coiled up inside of one of the bags. As I mentioned, both crew members will be getting set to head out port for their routing. Uh, this graphic shows the two legs that route port, which they'll take care of first. Uh, once that's complete, they'll route the two starboard legs that head out to S3. <clears throat> so Terry will head out first. He'll translate over the rat's nest. He'll be taking the aft translation path on the port side of the truss. And along the way, he'll be securing this cable with copper wire ties. And that will secure the cable to handrails uh, to make sure that it doesn't move and uh, cause any issues. Once he arrives at the boom, he'll remove two caps from the antennas. These are to protect the electrical connections. He'll then remove the remaining slack out of his cable bag. And then he will mate that cable to the inboard antenna. Meanwhile, Butch will be following Terry about 20 feet behind. Uh, you can see his cable routing path here. As he translate, uh, translates along the rat's nest, uh, he'll be actually putting both sets of cables into one set of wire ties until he gets to the point that you see here. At this point, Butch will break off and start routing his cable on the forward path along the nader side of the port truss. Uh, this will separate both cables by about 18 inches and it'll protect the system uh, from being taken out by a single debris strike. So once Butch arrives, he'll hand his cable off to Terry. He'll make that to the outboard antenna, completing the connections on the port side. So the last thing to do at this work site will be to install two retro reflectors onto the boom. Terry will take care of that. Here you see the reflectors uh, that will be used during this EVA. It's used for visiting vehicle range finding. Uh, you also see the delicate glass surfaces that we're trying to protect, and that's why we want to install these uh, last thing before we head out from the work site. At this point, they'll start cleaning up this work site. Uh, Butch will take the reflector bag, I'm sorry, Terry will take the reflector bag and bundle that to his empty cable reel bag. Butch will take the antenna bag and he'll bundle that with his empty cable reel bag. Both crew members will head back to the US laboratory. They'll stow their empty reel bags and the empty crew lock bag in the large ORU bag. And they'll both pick up a cable reel. And this time they'll head out starboard. Butch will lead this time. And here we see Butch's translation path. He'll take the aft path <clears throat> out to S3 and Terry will be taking the forward path. Once Butch arrives at S3, he'll get ready to remove the two protective caps uh, from the antenna. He'll stow those in the crew lock bag. Then he'll remove the remaining slack out of his bag and attach that to the inboard antenna. At this time, Terry should be arriving at the work site. Uh, he'll drop off the reflector bag and leave that for Butch. He'll then pick up the crew lock bag that now has caps and protective covers in it, and he'll bundle that with his empty cable reel bag. Terry will then pull out the remaining slack of his cable, hand that off to Butch, and Butch will mate the final connection to the C2V2 system, uh, the outboard connector on the, uh, on the starboard boom. At this point, Terry will head back towards the airlock. He'll take his empty reel bag and crew lock bag. He'll stow those into the large ORU bag and get this ready to bring back inside. Meanwhile, Butch will finish up out on the starboard truss. He'll install the final retro reflector onto the starboard boom. Once this is complete, he'll take the empty reflector bag and he'll stow that on his cable reel bag and head back to the airlock. Butch will ingress first with those two bags. Uh, then Terry will pass in his large ORU bag. Uh, and then Terry will ingress 
and he will close and lock the hatch, completing US EVA 31. Now, during the video, um, I did mention that we have a cable reel bag, showed you some pictures of that. Um, this actually shows, a this is a mock-up of the bag. So on the ground, we packed this bag with 100 feet of cable in it. See if I can get it open here. So the reel, or sorry, this is the reel here. Um, the connector that attaches to the antenna installs into this slot. And then we reeled up all 100 feet of cable onto this. So then when the crew gets it, they see a bag like this with a, a small slit of the cable coming out. So when the crew translates uh, out to their work site, the cable deploys automatically as they head out. Uh, this bag also has pockets on each end. These pockets hold wire tie caddies. Uh, these wire tie caddies hold nine wire ties each. These wire ties are used to secure the cable back to structure. Um, I think that, that concludes the US EVA 31 briefing. I'll head it back to the, or hand it back to the moderator for questions. All right. Thank you again to all of our panelists for walking us through that. And again, we'll open it up for questions now. We're going to start here in the room and then go to the phone bridge and then take a couple off of social media. If you're on the phone bridge, go ahead and press star one if you have a question to get added into the queue. Okay, I always go left to right, so let's start with Eric. Okay. I guess a question for, for Kevin Todd. Um, so when all the work is done, including these EBAs and, and others, I suspect later this year, um, sort of describe to me the situation with the ports. How many ports for docking will you have, and or is each of them assigned to a specific kind of vehicle? And so how many we have for uh, the Russian vehicles? How many we have for progress and so forth? Sure. Um, when you look at the USOS, our, our goal by the end of the year is to have um, two berthing ports uh, for the uh, commercial crew vehicles. And those ports would be uh, node, uh, node 2 forward where the PMA2 is right now. Um, and we'll have a, an international docking adapter at that location. We'll also have one on the node 2 zenith location, which by that time we'll have PMA3, pressurized mating adapter number three, relocated to that zenith port. And we will also put in an IDA on that one as well. So that, those will be two, our two ports for the commercial crew vehicles. And uh, either one of the, the, the folks who are currently building that hardware can come to either one of those ports. So, so there's no issue with, with that part of it. As far as the, the cargo vehicles, uh, we'll have the, the Node 2 Nader location that we currently use today. That's our primary location. Um, but uh, um, uh, because we're taking the backup port that's up on top the Node 2 Zenith and making that a, a crewed vehicle port with an IDA and a PMA on it. Now we have to create another one. So we'll, that's where we'll, we'll put uh, the, the Node 1 Nader location will become the second port uh, for, for berthing of commercial cargo vehicles. So if you think of it, two Nader, two Nader ports for the commercial cargo vehicles, and then you have the, the front and the, and the Zenith for the, for the crew vehicles. Cargo. That's right, two for cargo, two for crew. Uh, and then when you look on, on the Russian segment, uh, their, their number of ports is, is, has not changed any. Uh, they'll still have the, uh, the FGB location, uh, which uh, they have MRM-1 uh, there now. Um, and uh, that's, uh, they dock a, a Soyuz there at this point. They also have MRM-2, uh, which is up on the Zenith side, which is where they dock uh, also the other Soyuz. And then they, in addition to that, they, they dock Progress vehicles currently on the aft, uh, which is where they docked yesterday, um, the aft part of the service module. Uh, and then uh, also in the docking compartment, they dock a Progress well, there as well, which is on the Nader. So also you'll have eight ports on station? Correct. Okay. Gina? How much has the supply chain been a challenge for you in configuring these spacewalks? The, uh, I don't know that it's been that much of a challenge. I mean, certainly, uh, I think we're, we're starting to get, get up and running pretty good with the commercial cargo capability. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be key to us in terms of being able to do the job that we've set out to do this year. Uh, the SpaceX vehicles have to bring the docking adapters for us. Um, so, so in terms of the logistics part of it, um, it's going to be critical, um, but but very much doable. I think we'll still be able to contain, you know, maintain a, a healthy science complement uh, throughout uh, if we're able to to get all the SpaceX flights we need this year. 
um, as well. We'll have an HDV flight out in the in the summer, early fall time frame as well. So um, we'll, we'll uh, I think we'll be okay logistics wise, and we should still be able to uh, to finish out the work ahead of us. Uh, Mark Corot for Aviation Maintenance, also for um, uh, Kenny Todd. Can you uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the on the failure modes of the fan pump separators? Do they just not start, so you can't do a spacewalk, or could they fail during a spacewalk, and what would be the consequence? Sure. Um, relative to uh, a condition for going out of the hatch is, is we have to have the fan pep pump setups uh, running. It, it needs to be spinning in order for us to, to go outside. Uh, in this instance, for the two suits that we're talking about, uh, we haven't had any issues at this point with the fan pump setups and them not, not spinning up. And, uh, and so uh, we feel very good about that at this point. One of the things that we are working on is to, is to make sure that we, we're comfortable that once the crew is outside the hatch, that there, there won't be any degradation associated with this corrosion that could cause the, the pump to seize once you're outside. Now, if you encounter that scenario, again, our, our ops guys here will tell you that that's something they understand exactly what to do uh, when, they, when they hit that scenario um, and uh, all the way up to getting the crew back in. Uh, there's a, a totally separate backup system uh, in the suit that uh, provides uh, plenty of capability for the crew to, uh, to return and ingress the airlock and, and get back on, on O2 back in the airlock. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, this is uh, not a, a risk to, to crew, if you will, in terms of, of loss of life. This is, you know, we want to go out of the hatch. We want to make sure that we've got suits that'll, that'll run for the entirety of the EVA. But if there's anything out there that, that surprises us once we get out there, um, we have a way to deal with it, and it's it's the same way that that we would have dealt with any other failure in that particular area uh, leading up to this one. And just to follow up, I, I think that's the the 30 minute emergency oxygen, but also wondered if you could talk about the heritage of the fan pump separators in the two suits that are assigned sure. to Wilmore and and Burns. Sure. Um, the suit uh, that, uh, that Terry will be in, uh, we refer to as 05, that particular fan pump sup uh, was installed in December. Uh, that was indeed the first suit that, that had the, uh, the fan pump sup that didn't spin up. And so, uh, so we flew another one up uh, and, and installed it in, in the early December timeframe. And, uh, and again, that one um, has been through several cycles since that point. Uh, we're continuing to keep our eye on it in terms of one of the signatures that you see with this corrosion is you see uh, a higher current signature uh, draw on the motor and, uh, and, and there's nothing there that, that at this point that's uh, uh, leading us to believe that, that it's going to seize up. We are seeing some, some peaks in the data that, that lead us to believe there is some corrosion in the bearings at this point. Um, Based on on water getting getting introduced into uh, into the uh, backside of the fan there, uh, but uh, again, a large part of what we're doing now is trying to assure ourselves that that corrosion is uh, is limited to the point that it won't uh, cause the the fan to have a problem once it goes outside, and uh, and that we can uh, we can get through the EVA without an issue. So a lot of work going on in that area. The other suit with O3, that's, that's the newest suit on orbit right now. And uh, to my knowledge, that is the, the fan pump sup that went up with that suit. Uh, so I, we, haven't, we haven't changed that one out at this point. Um, uh, I will tell you that, that once we suspected that, that we had a problem in this area um, with, with water getting behind this fan, these fans based on the number of times that we're cycling the, the fan pumps and, and putting extra water into that area, um, we implemented a, a, a dry out procedure that allows us to get a little more airflow in that area. So uh, at least these two suits, um, we've, we've been able to, through the last series of flushes that we've done, implement a, a, uh, um, a new strategy for getting a little more air into that area and drying them out uh, so, that, uh, so that we can minimize any, any further uh, degradation to, to the best that we can. Robert? Uh, 
Robert from Collect Space, um, just to work off Mark's question and to verify use of the timing would depend on your understanding of the fan pump. Um, so, but as of right now, you're still working towards Friday being the first uh, spacewalk, correct? At this point, I think um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge a little bit on that. Uh, I've got an IMMT, a mission management team meeting tomorrow morning. Um, I think there's enough data still left on the table that that uh, uh, I'm not I'm not going to throw that out here and say we're absolutely going to go on Friday. I, I don't want to put that kind of pressure on the team from a schedule standpoint. I know there's enough uh, work being done and, and uh, analysis still to be completed. Um, I can't I'm not saying we can't do it, but at this point I don't want to I don't think I want to want to necessarily stamp approval for Friday on it just yet. I want to wait and get through the the mission management team in the morning and see where the team stands and see where the data leads us. And if you did have to delay that first one, is it a day for day slip for the others as well? Our, our thinking at this point, uh, with this being a triple and knowing that we're, we've got, you know, uh, Butch coming back here in the middle of March, we're, we're operating in a window here trying to figure out the best way if we don't start this, this triple set on Friday, uh, how to do it in a way that it doesn't totally derail some of the other things we have going on between now and when, when Butch comes home. So um, our thinking right now is to try to stay on the, on the dates that we have. So if we don't do the first EVA on, on Friday, uh, chances are based on whatever it is that drives us off of Friday, if it's additional data, if it's completion of testing or whatever, we, our best guess probably is to try to go to Tuesday, which is where our second EVA was at this point. And, and so that way we can kind of keep the spacing and we'll just, uh, we'll just evaluate the third EVA and if we have time on the, on, the, on the back end, we'll drop it in before we bring Butch home if everything's continuing to, to look good on all the different fronts. Okay, we'll go ahead and go to the phone bridge at this point. Again, if you have a question and you're on the phone bridge, press star one and you'll get added into the queue. So why don't we go ahead and start off with space.com. Hi, Kenneth. Can you tell us if there is a deadline by which you have to make a decision if the spacewalk will go ahead on Friday? Well, I think uh, I think I've got all the way up till till uh, tomorrow. Um, probably about middle of the day, we need to get the word on board to the crew. Our ops team needs to start getting into the the final preps, uh, which means the the team that's going to execute the EVA needs to know that so that they can get the proper personnel rested and, and ready to go. So I think we've got a little bit of runway, um, but uh, uh, again, I, 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 we can't run it too late into the day tomorrow uh, just, uh, just because of the crew day and, and making sure that, uh, that they're fully aware of what we're thinking. Okay, that's all we have on the phone bridge for right now. Let's take a couple of social media questions. We've been soliciting some from our followers. I think we have time for one or two. We're getting a lot of questions on uh, social media, but we only have time for a couple. So this one um, comes from Margaret on Twitter. She wants to know, what will be the most challenging aspect of Friday's EVA for Butch and for Terry? Friday's EVA? Or the first one? The first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> most challenging. Uh, probably just the, the overall length of the, the number of cables that they need to route and, and keeping that straight. It's there's nothing that's very um, especially difficult about this EVA, but it is a lot of a lot of cables and wire ties to manipulate and things, so some hand fatigue. And I think that's a good segue into the next one. Um, I understand the astronauts will be routing cable outside the station. What activities did they do on ISS to prepare for that before these spacewalks? I know Butch told me that he was he was doing the hand exercises that they, they do, so making sure their hands are in good shape for that, as well as, all, of course, all of our normal EVA preparations that they do, studying the timelines and getting their suits ready. So. Okay, let's take a couple of quick follow-ups here in the room. Mark. Uh, Mark Carreau for Aviation Week for uh, Arthur Thomason. I'm sorry, I think I made some notes on the kinds of communications that will be covered with these two different antennas, but could you go over the range again? Is there some navigation and guidance in there? Is it voice, that kind of thing? <coughs> it's front. doing docking for visiting vehicles, yeah. And so it's just telemetry, I guess, exchange. Yeah, that's right, and, and there's also uh, reflectors that are installed, and so lasers are shined on those reflectors for range finding with docking. 
Eric? Uh, yeah, just a quick follow-up. How many runs in the NBL did these guys do in preparation for each of these spacewalks? Would they do like, you know, EVA 29 six times in the pool and then do EVA 30, or did they kind of combine the tasks to, to prepare? Yeah, we, uh, Butch, and, Butch and Terry saw the first EVA. They each saw it once with a different crew member, and they saw it once together. Um, you know, in, in the post-shuttle era, we don't get to practice every EVA multiple times like we used to, and so we have changed our, our uh, training so that it's a, a skills-based kind of a thing. So they get, I think it's 10 NBL runs through their entire training that, um, that covers all of the contingency things they could need to repair on the space station, as well as skills they might need to do on planned EVAs. EVA 30 goes that the crew did run some runs the first half of the EVA with removing the PMA2 cover and then the, the finishing the, the cable routing. As far as the, the lead lubrication, we had some work just in a 1G environment because the, the uh, hardware at the MBL wasn't um, mocked up to the highest fidelity that we'd need to do um, to, to actually get the lubrication in all the spots. So Terry did do a run um, in the MBL with a lead that was basically a, an empty cavity of the latches. Um, so they, they have some um, great training videos on board and they're practicing using you know, the, the BLT to get to the, the lubrication spots. Um, and then the rest of the EVA with Butch on node three, it's, it's rather you know, that standard, standard ops of removing hardware and you know, bolts and, and things. So. so no pressure, this is dress rehearsal and opening night, like all in one for the spacewalks. Um, I, they're, they're, they're great crew members of EVA crew members. I mean, they're, they're fully qualified to do it, but you know, we don't anticipate anything surprising during these EVAs since they, even though they didn't do a, a full end run to run of these spacewalks. Okay, one more real quick, Robert. Uh, Rob Perlman with Collect Space. Um, just stepping back for a moment, this, if, if these do get off um, this week or, or next, um, they're coming about a month before uh, the 50th anniversary of EVA. Um, can anyone who wants to take it uh, talk about what um, the complexity of this EVA sort of says about how far we've come in the 50, past 50 years? I guess, so, um, I mean, from from EVA 30 standpoint, uh, lubricating the the Lee, you know, was never intended to be lubricated that way. Um, it's been on orbit for a while, and they they think it needs some of this wet lubrication just so just for the fact that you develop a tool that's on board, you know, you develop a tool out of items that are on board to lubricate what you actually need to fix it because we can't bring it home to fix it. Um, I think that does say a lot of how far we've come of. Um, adapting to hardware being up in space for a long time and fixing things with what you have on orbit to get the job done. I think kind of to build on, on what Karina says, we've, we've changed things since the shuttle era too where we would do maybe 10 runs in the water. They would get the, this uh, EVA choreographed. The crew knew every single detail. Uh, where now we plant it on the ground, um, get it ironed out on the ground, and we send them up briefing packages, videos, um, the graphic like you saw that we showed here, all that stuff helps the crew study on board and minimizes the training they have on the ground. Okay, well that's gonna go ahead and wrap it up for us today. Thanks again for joining us for this EVA preview briefing. Uh, and as always, you can go onto our website, get all of the latest times, coverage times, uh, and the latest information on these EVAs as they get ready to unfold at www.nasa.gov stations. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.